Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this evening's talk on Goa, Goa Heritage, a status report by my good friend Heta Pandit. I'm so glad to see so many people uh, join this program. And I'll say good evening and good morning because I see that we have friends of Heta's and Goa lovers who've joined us from far away in the South American continent. So welcome all guests on behalf of the chairperson and the trustees of the CSMBS, uh, myself and my entire committee at the Museum Society of Bombay. A very warm welcome to all of you. And Heta, I'm really, really delighted that I know we've been connected over the years and I've known Heta for several decades, like indeed many of our friends on the talk this evening, but it's a very special thing to welcome you, Heta, because I know your passion for everything you do and your passion for the topic this evening and your passion for writing and introducing us uh, to various aspects of the history, the sociology, even the philosophy of what makes a state like Goa tick. Some of us who are not familiar with Heta, please indulge me for a few minutes while I introduce you to her. And it's good for the YouTube because that goes really to many, many more, several hundred people. Heta's first job was with the famed ethnologist, Dr. Jane Goodall on a chimpanzee research station in Tanzania in East Africa. <clears throat> on her return to India in 1983, Heta volunteered with the Bombay Environmental Action Group, as it was then called, BEAG, and initiated several heritage preservation projects through the Indian Heritage Society Mumbai chapter. And I noticed that the current chairperson and several members of the IHS are here with us this evening. Traumatized by the riots in 1993 in her beloved Bombay, she left the city for Munar at first and then Goa, putting all her energies into the preservation of Goan homes and houses. She's written nine books on Goan heritage, starting with Houses of Goa, a really delightful coffee table book, Hidden Hands, The Master Builders of Goa, Dust and Other Short Stories, lovely little novella, Walking in Goa, Walking in Old Goa, and Walking with Angels. There's more to a life than a house in Goa, grinding stones, songs from Goa. Heta, you do us all proud as your friends. Thank you. She's a Homi Baba fellow and a founder member of the Goan Heritage Action Group, which I think she started and has revitalized after spending more than two decades in Goa. Currently, she's working on her second volume, Grinding Stones, Stories from Goan Houses, and a book title, Objects and Memories from Goa. She's fluent, bilingual in Konkani, Marathi, and of course, Gujarati, and undertakes a lot of translations for those who do not read these subjects, or read these languages, and can better appreciate them in English. Goa has endeared itself to people from all over the world. It is our tiny coastal state and is more, more known as a holiday and entertainment resort destination than for its architecture, culture, social and oral history. The stereotypical branding of Goa as a former Portuguese colony has been both deliberate and debilitating to its true spirit and culture. This talk aims at drawing attention to these aspects of Goa's priceless and fast fading heritage and Heta has documented a lot of it before it slips into antiquity. And who knows, with the doc documentation, a true revival will start in some of these objects that we have lost. So there's much cause to celebrate. Heta points out the flaws in the current systems and attitudes that adversely affect this fragile, natural, built, tangible and intangible heritage. So with these few words, Heta, a very, very good welcome to you. 
and we're looking forward to the talk. We're looking forward to a lively Q&A. If you haven't been able to type your questions in, as my colleague Anita said at the beginning, we can, you can unmute yourself and just ask us, ask Heta your questions. So thank you very, very much. And back to you, Anita, and the technical team for sharing the screen with Heta Pandit. A warm welcome to all of you. Sit back and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Okay, so let me begin by saying thank you very much, Firoza, and the Museum Society, and all of you for joining me today in a little, a, a little capsule, a status report of the state of Goan heritage. I'm not saying I'm an expert on Goa's heritage. There are there may be many more erudite and uh, more research people who have done more research on the subject. But, and I've been in Goa only for 21 or 26 years, I would say. So um, whatever I have learned, I'm going to put before you today. The first slide, please. Uh, this is a familiar scene to most of us. We've always been looking at scenes like this, picture postcard uh, depictions of Goa. You've got the ocean, you have the beaches. You have the cross on the beach, you have the trawlers and little painted boats, and it's all very quaint and very cute. This is the stereotypical image that most of us see, most of us take back with us when we go. And this image of Goa is actually misleading, according to me, because there's a lot more to Goa than just the churches and the beaches. In fact, Goa's population is 78% Hindu, 2% Muslim, and 20% uh, Catholic. But because the Christian churches of old Goa influenced the churches of the religious in Goa, and we had very high vantage points where churches were located deliberately, Portuguese stayed in Goa for 451 years which is the most recent colonization. Before that 21 years, Yusuf Adil Shah from Bijapur ruled over Goa. And before that, the Kadambas from Karnataka, two sets of Kadambas from Banwasipura. And they, we don't, we, because the Portuguese ruled over Goa for a very long time, 451 years, they left behind a legacy uh, of conversion that is why they are top of mind for most of us who visit Goa. The other thing, the next slide, please. The other thing I want to uh, bring to your note, the next slide, please. To your notice is this stereotypical image of Goa has been reiterated, reinforced deliberately as a sort of branding by the government of Goa since liberation. Goa was liberated from Portuguese rule in 1961. And yet these are the kind of images that we keep seeing uh, in, all over Goa. This is the kind of branding that our own government has systematically done. If you have a Portuguese name, for example, for your shop in Panjim, you will not be allowed to change it. Surnames were also spelt in a different way than, for example, Kam, uh, Kamat was spelt C-A-M-O-T-I-M. -M. And a lot of people do, uh, will still continue to spell, uh, to replace the K with a C. This suits business. It's good for the state because lots of tourists imagine that it's like a poor man's Europe and they come in flocks and it, it boosts up Goa's economy. So the deliberate branding of Goa has been uh, one of the things that I personally feel, find very irksome. Next please. But I won't go into that just yet. The other kind of branding that the Goa government has done is the promotion of certain festivals like the carnival. Carnival, in fact, this is the time where carnival is celebrated. 
and during pandemic, we should not be celebrating, we should not be collecting in crowds. These are old pictures. So on my left, you see, this to me is taken by Daniel D'Souza, a photographer, and it's a very sort of uh, illustrated picture of the kind of fun, frolic, sun, sand, and sea destination that has been promoted since the 1970s. Now, on the right is a, a family, is a, a group that I personally know. This sari is called the Kunbi Sari. The picture is of a group of dancers and singers from Kepe area, North Goa. They are Christian Gaudas. So the Gauda community is either Hindu or Christian. And I've just learned that there have been some groups in the, amongst the Christians who have gone through a Shuddhi Karana and who have uh, uh, gone back to their uh, Hindu roots. So to the extreme right is my favorite singer, Amelia Dyers. And she, in fact, leads this group uh, uh, in the singing and dancing of the uh, Gaudas. And during Carnival, this kind of promotion happens where uh, it's not a true depiction, according to me, of the culture or the backbone of people. No understanding, a deeper understanding of the people and what they represent, their values and so on. But just a cosmetic, very, very sort of magazine-like depiction of Goa's culture. Next, please. So what happens when such a thing is promoted? A branding of Goa as a sun, sea, sand destination. And uh, this is the kind of cultural showcasing that happens during carnival or big festivals like that. We become spectators to our own culture. We are no longer participants. We have become spectators to our own culture. Commercial element enters that aspect. Sponsorship enters that aspect. It cannot survive without that. And that is why you have groups, for example, who are in uniforms singing or dancing at the carnival. Spontaneity has taken a back seat. This is what I have seen over the last 26 years. Next, please. So what is the Goa I'm talking about? It's the small villages. Goa lives in its 197 villages where each village has its own little system. It's like a little republic of its own. And that's the kind of Goa I would like to see and not the kind of branding that the government is doing. But that's my personal view and a view of a lot of my friends here. Next, please. That's what, this is something that I was talking about. This is a festival called the Bonderam, where two groups in the uh, Divar Island, they, they celebrate a sort of recall, memory recall of a fight between two territorial groups. And they put flags over there to emphasize the territory that they, and this is a recall, but it's the uniforms that I have trouble with. That, you know, the, the spontaneity in the culture has become like a showcase of the culture, a sort of very synthetic view. Next, please. And this again is a picture postcard view, a small shrine. Some of these shrines incidentally are not uh, consecrated, but that doesn't seem to uh, matter at all. And some of them, Hindu and uh, Christian shrines are actually dedicated to a saint or mostly to Our Lady of Rosary. But the, if you go back to its origins, there is a concept called a Rakhno or a Rakhandar in every village. He's a spiritual guardian. And some of these shrines have been Christianized and original location is of a Rakhno or a Rakhandar or a spiritual guardian. And this concept is a very important concept. This is before Aryanization of Goan deities and before the uh, Christianization of the Aryanized Sanskrit deities. Next, please. 
again, the uniform, but we also have lots of festivals celebrating Goan life. This is a bread festival uh, where the winnowing fan or the soup uh, acts as a serving dish and bread is uh, celebrated. So it's, a, it's a really quite a, a charming festival uh, held in many, many villages of Goa. Uh, this is, uh, thank you. Uh, next, please. On the other hand, there are some food items which are not exclusive to either Hindu or Catholic. The crescent-shaped sweets filled with coconut and jaggery, for example, here called nyorios, and uh, in, they make them in Maharashtra as well. They are made by both communities. So the point I'm trying to make is we are a syncretic society without uh, a doubt. It's, uh, the state is being promoted as uh, a Christian or Catholic, but we are actually a syncretic society. All our Hindu, some of our Hindu customs are taken into our Catholic lifestyle. And we have to acknowledge that some of the cuisine is also overlaps. It also overlaps. Next, please. Here's our Ganesh festival. Uh, for us here in Goa, our Ganesh festival is a private affair. It's a family affair. There are very few Sarvajanic Ganeshas. Uh, Sarvajanic or community Ganeshas were actually, a, it's a Bombay thing, uh, which, which started during the freedom movement in Bombay. Uh, where they found it as an, uh, they devised an excuse for people to meet during Ganesh festival. British government at that time could not stop people. And that is uh, how the Ganesh festival migrated about 160 years ago to Bombay. That is uh, my belief. But here in Goa, it's a very private, uh, very, uh, very uh, personal and a very family festival. Uh, Ganesh, there are some families who celebrate it every alternate year. Some families who celebrate it every year for one day, three days, seven days, 11 days, and family traditions are maintained, carried forward from generation to generation. Next, please. This is another little festival that happens. It's a very private thing where the Janoi or the thread uh, is uh, changed once a year. So here's this father and son duo. They've, uh, they're changing their jan Janoi or Janvai. And uh, it's, a, it's a very charming thing where they go to a temple and they put the, uh, the old Janoi into a, a water body near the temple and take the new one, the blessed one uh, from the priest. There are little snippets like that of culture which go past the, the, you know, the general gambit of uh, Goa's branding. Next, please. This is one of our most uh, famous and very, very relevant festivals. It's called the Shigmo. It's an all night uh, festival. There is a one school of thought that says because of the Portuguese colonization, a lot of Hindu festivals that were celebrated during the day, they moved into the celebration at night. But uh, Dr. Khedekar says that that's not true. Uh, uh, festivals are celebrated at night traditionally because these are farming communities and most of the farming communities are working during the day. At night, they would celebrate these festivals. And then a huge pile of wood is made. And uh, these are these little parasol-like things that you see are called sotris. They are blessed. People who participate in this festival uh, wear a garland. They are considered sacred. Nobody touches them. I mean, in that sense that uh, they are not to be polluted. And uh, they fast for a couple of days before the festival. So they, they are pure, considered pure. And the next slide, you will see what happens after the fire is lit. It's this huge, massive bonfire. Next, please. And people walk on this fire. People walk on this fire. It's a beautiful festival uh, at Lerai. Uh, and she is one of the seven founding goddesses of Goa. So she's the eldest uh, sister of seven sisters and a brother who seems to be missing uh, from worship. And these, each of these seven sisters have a story to tell. The youngest sister was Morjai, 
And because they say everybody got fed up of her crying, the toddler, they put her in a basket and they put, they put her down in the river. And she landed up at uh, Morji. But when Lerai, the eldest sister, realized this, she had to do penance for this. She felt very bad about it. And she lit a huge fire and she walked on fire. So this is in memory of, it's a memory recall of that incident. Next, please. Now, most of the uh, festivals are male oriented, including the, uh, the Zatra or the Nataks that happen uh, outside the temple. In our uh, geographical memory, there is always a, a space in front of the temple. That space is a sacred space and it's called a mand. In that mand, you have the performances. You have the kirtan cars, for example, and they start the performances. And the, uh, the interesting part is that women, women's roles were never played by women in these nataks uh, or kirtans. They were always played by male, uh, male members of the community. And women are confined to uh, be, being spectators in their own uh, community. So that's an interesting aspect of, uh, of our culture, Goan culture. The other part is the syncretic, very beautiful. Uh, this is Gode Modni on the right hand side, which may have come uh, with uh, certain battles or uh, fighting tribes that moved into Goa. Goa has had a lot of migrations uh, from, uh, from Bengal Bihar region, from Kashmir region, from uh, Gujarat, from Maharashtra, from other parts of Konkan and uh, this Gode Modni dance is interesting if you trace its roots. I think in Rajasthan and in Gujarat, Maharashtra also, they have this uh, dance. So we have a sort of uh, amalgamation or assimilation of various cultures in Goa, which gets missed out completely from public attention or visitors' attention. Next, please. We are, a, we are very peaceful, there's no doubt about it. And there's always some festival or the other where both Hindus and Muslims get together. In fact, there is one house uh, in, uh, in Pedne uh, where a Dao was uh, sinking and the Hindu family runs to the water and rescues this Arab Dao. And there is the mast is there. And that house was then renamed Arabo House after the Arabs who were given shelter there. That mast or piece of the mast is still there. And every year, this Hindu home in Perne, uh, in Dargali, Arabo House, celebrates a Urus or a celebration to commemorate this event. So we are all about recall, memory, and furthering culture uh, between communities. This is a mosque on the right hand side. Goa also has a Muslim uh, history, which, uh, which people choose to ignore, but uh, it's really worth uh, listening. Most of it is uh, in Ponda, Ponda area. Uh, next, please. We also may have had small battles happening in various parts of Goa. This on my left is a Virahal or Viragal or a hero stone. If you see a hero stone elsewhere, there is a panel of three different graphics or five different graphics. And as you know, in Indian uh, uh, pantheon, it's always in odd numbers. So you have a battle scene in which a hero or, a, or, or even a heroine, uh, there are some dedicated to women warriors in which she fights or he fights and uh, he's shown much larger than life. His head is, uh, he's beheaded in the battle and uh, the village honors him by uh, putting him on a shivlingam uh, to commemorate his sacrifice for the village community. So we have these in Bandora, for example, and also in Kanpun. Uh, they're just lying there in the, in the fields 
and they're considered sacred. Uh, so nobody touches them. Hopefully they'll stay there. Uh, some, uh, of course, have been mu mu moved to museums. To my right is Sarojini. She's a, a singer and a, a composer and also a researcher. And she sings at the grinding stone. Now, this is one aspect of Goan culture that has been, that had been neglected. And uh, women in the old days were married off at the age of seven and eight, very young. And they're not allowed to go back to their uh, married, uh, mother's homes. So what happened now, we always think, we, we always have this impression that Goa is liberated. We wear uh, what we like, we go out with whoever we like, we go for dances and so on. But that is one community or one aspect of Goa. There is another community in Goa, in Valpoi, Kepe area, in remote uh, agricultural belts, that where the women were married off in the old days at the age of seven or eight, not allowed to go back to their mother's homes. And the grinding stone, which was the first chore given to the women of the house, or the girls rather, that became the girl's best friend or confidant. So I have a collection of grinding uh, songs and uh, others are also collecting now and uh, teaching these songs because now nobody wants to use a grinding stone. Everybody has electricity and mixies. So this is one uh, aspect of uh, a culture that we're trying to document. Next, please. Goa also has petroglyphs. As Anita was saying a little while ago, she, had, she was inspired by these petroglyphs in Pansali Mal, Uzgali Mal, and so on. Uh, to, to look for petroglyphs in the Konkan belt in Maharashtra. And she did manage to find, she was saying, uh, quite a few. So that would be interesting also. There's the bull, Ibu bull on the right, Zebu bull. And there's some, there are some, next please. There are some mandalas. Uh, there are some um, animals, birds. There is uh, a maze. And there are many, many mo motifs like this. These were actually covered, uh, the water has been uh, poured over them so that to take a better picture. Otherwise, it's very, rather difficult to spot them. Unfortunately, picnickers uh, valued the, the petroglyphs very little. And uh, you often find beer bottles. I had to do a Photoshop and remove all, all the beer bottles from these pictures. Uh, so and that's unfortunate. Uh, but there you go. And uh, I think the least we can do is put uh, some acrylic sheets or glass sheets or something over them to protect. Because this is on the river Kushavati. And the water, when it rises, it covers these petroglyphs completely. Next, please. This is uh, good news uh, in the sense that we had a very small community of giants in Goa. And I have a feeling that they came here, they settled here for a very short time, and they either got merged with the other Sanskrit speaking or Sanskritized communities of Brahmins and Shardos, uh, or they left Goa. I'm not sure which. Now, this building has been restored by our Directorate of Archives and Archaeology. Kudos to them. Uh, Blossom Madeira is the in charge. And uh, uh, this has been restored recently. Uh, whatever pieces they could find, they have uh, put back. And uh, what, what pieces, they, they did an algorithm and found out what, what, what was missing. And they put those pieces back. So this is a recent picture of the restored Jain Basti. And I have a feeling that the name Basti is because they just were camping here for a short time, maybe a couple of years. But as history goes into thousands of uh, years, uh, we, we would call a couple of years uh, camp. Next, please. Goa is not uh, known for its bird life, but I can tell you it's very, very rich in bird life, animal life. And the recent threat of the three linear projects to Mole and Mavi Sanctuary and a few heritage houses on either side of the double track railway line all these are the current threats that we are facing. This is just not even three minutes from my house in Saligam, in the paddy fields after the harvest. Next, please. 
Speaking of birds, uh, I was fortunate with Natasha Fernandez of Museum of Christian Art to discover this little chapel that we both call the Secret Chapel. It's a chapel in the convent of Santa Monica. These are hand painted with vegetable dyes. And the convent was a cloistered convent. For those who don't know what a cloistered convent is, they were nuns who entered the convent and never left. They brought with them their jewelry, their money, their lands, their slaves, everything into the convent, and they never ever left. And the whole convent, there was not a single male member, not even a staff, not even a gardener. So all the gardening, cooking, maintenance, everything was done by the nuns. When they came into the, entered the convent, they were not even allowed to keep their own names. So they were known by bird names. So there were sparrow and pigeon and so on, and different nuns were given these bird names, and the birds or the nuns were supposed to be in charge of different various things. Now, I'm just wondering whether these paintings on the walls of this little secret chapel were done by the nuns, whether some nuns wanted to put their identity onto the walls and they painted themselves in, in the form of birds, I don't know because birds also have biblical significance. So it could be uh, from the Bible also. But the pigments are definitely vegetable and mineral dyes. They grew their own vegetables, they grew their own uh, uh, medicines, uh, plants and so on. So these are definitely done by the nuns, uh, by the plants uh, material that was found in the convent, in the courtyards. Next, please. They must, somebody must have been a botanist as well in the, amongst the nuns because we see a lot of panels with the plants and these are like botanical specimens. They're not just artistic or very arty renderings. So in fact, we are looking and Natasha and I are looking for some researcher or an organization or institution who can help us decipher these drawings and paintings and help us read them. We don't have the expertise in Goa, unfortunately. Next, please. Thank you. One of the uh, other art forms that has disappeared from Goa is glass painting. Glass painting, as most of your museum buffs will know, it was done from the back and without any firm uh, black outline to the figures or the uh, various details. So these we find these, they say uh, come from the 18th century, but I have seen glass paintings dated to 1942, 1950 also. And if you go to a temple called the Ramnath temple, you will see in the assembly hall, a lot of these uh, temple, uh, temple renderings or uh, mythological narration, narrations in glass. Now I was showing Vivek Menezes, uh, uh, one of these, uh, which I have in my home of Devki Krishna, and he saw a European influence. So it, it is possible that Hindu art was influenced by European uh, art as well. Sometimes uh, you had that up to the, in the, especially in the 1930s, there was the European or what I call Bombay influence. Next please. This is also an art that has disappeared, unfortunately. It's lacquer work. It was done in a village called Kunkoli by a community called Chitaris. Today, if you go there, you will find a very small dwindling community of Chitaris, but they use paint because lacquer is no longer allowed to be harvested. So, but this is what is called a dowry box. And I have a feeling that this was either Chinese or Japanese in origin because one box fits into the neck, into the other, into the other, into the other. And the, finally, the smallest box is so small for jewelry. And these were meant for clothes and so on. And uh, dowry box, we are calling them dowry boxes, but they were actually uh, what the bride was given. Uh, both Hindu and uh, Catholic brides were given these boxes as part of their trousseau. Next, please. Now we come to the built heritage, the architecture. Uh, this is uh, the side wing of uh, a favorite, one of my favorite houses in Goa. It was a family house, expanded. It's called Panjim Inn now. 
and uh, to the right is Gitanjali Art Gallery. It was also a house. Then they rented it out, gave it to a school. The school uh, was asked to leave. And finally, Panjim Inn has bought this place. And there's an art gallery now also. So this is uh, like the, the good news. Next, please. This is Panjim Inn from the front. It's little garden. And uh, it's got a restaurant on top. Next, please. And uh, it's an ideal uh, example. And one of our first examples of restoration of Goan furniture. You see these chairs are all Goan and uh, 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 Goan furniture, Goan flooring and uh, the building itself has been very beautifully restored by the Sukija family. Ajit Sukija and uh, his son, Jack Ajit Sukija and, and lots of lots of people visit this, live here, enjoy this and enjoy the heritage uh, precinct that was declared a conservation zone as early as way back as 1974. So these are some of the good things that have happened. And incidentally, if you're wondering why the furniture is so heavy, it's because when the Jesuits were becoming powerful in Goa, they wanted to keep the Indian teak uh, trees exclusively for the church. So they had a sort of unwritten rule at that time saying all furniture in Goan houses must be made of rosewood or ebony. No teak is to be used for furniture. That's why you have all these heavy, heavy tables, chairs and beds and so on. Of course, a lot of the furniture was influenced by Bombay as well, especially the planter's chair and so on, which is not in the picture, but I think we're all familiar with the planter's chair with this big uh, arms that jut out, which originated, according to me, in Sri Lanka from the sugarcane uh, and uh, uh, tea planters who, uh, who must have designed it for their use. And then it came to India and from India, it came to British India, it came to Portuguese Goa. Next, please. This is a view of Panjim Inn. Uh, it's a brand new building but completely and utterly compatible with the neighborhood and with the uh, original structure that we've just seen. Next, please. This is one of my, since you're all museum uh, buffs, uh, this is one of my favorite museums. I've served on the committee for a couple of years, uh, some years ago. Museum of Christian Art is now open. Please do visit the website. And when you come to Goa, do visit uh, visit us and visit the Museum of Christian Art. It's got some of the finest, most exclusive pieces in Goa, donated by a lot of uh, homeowners or people who left Goa and have gone abroad and very kindly donated to the museum. And the most interesting part in this museum is that it shows you how syncretic Goan society is. Although it's called Museum of Christian Art, I was joking with Natasha the other day, saying we should change the name to Museum, Museum of Syncretic Art, actually. Next, please. Here's a gem. If you see, uh, climb all of these steps. This was originally an Adil Shah fort, an vantage point that overlooks the Mandovi River, the Sikh Cathedral, and Divar on the right, and the mouth of the river right up to uh, Panjim, you can see from here. So it must have been a very important vantage point during the Adil Shah rule, a very short rule in uh, Goa. But the interesting part is the little bit of red art that you see on the first, on the upper floor. This is Kavi art, unique to Goa. The wall is plastered with white lime, and then a design is drawn out the design is etched out and filled with a mix of red soil, charcoal, and lime again. And this Kavi art during Inquisition perhaps went left Goa to Karnataka and to Maharashtra. So you see it in Savantwadi, you see it in uh, Karnataka, in nearby villages, Ankola, Sirsi, and so on. And in fact, uh, there were no artists as such who did the Kavi. Uh, they were, some of them were just artists who, uh, who designed sets for the stages. 
and they did this on the side. Kavi is also done in reverse, where the main, main panel is red and the white is etched in. Next, please. Here's two very fine examples of Kavi. Again, the lotus is also a, a fine uh, carry forward of syncretic art because a lot of the artists were Hindu and they brought in their motives. Sometimes you see an armchair, for example, where the Hindu craftsman has put in a little Krishna somewhere or a little Saraswati somewhere, and it's in a Catholic home uh, with a, alongside there's a toddy tapper or activities that uh, the craftsman has seen in his village. Even in Museum of Christian Art, you see some kind of li a little infant Jesus with uh, bracelets and uh, anklets, a waistband, and uh, a, a, you know, a little amulet around the neck. It's really fascinating to see. So the lotus finds a place here in this Christian art rendering in the uh, chapel of Our Lady of the Mount that we've just seen the exterior of. Next, please. Here's a fine example of Kavi, uh, because sometimes when there are no artists available, uh, the Kavi is rendered in paint, but I look at things optimistically. Uh, and uh, I see that at least the motives have been saved. And this little rope motif that you see, sometimes called a rope, sometimes a tidal wave. If you ever happen to go to California, and you go to San, San Juan Bautista, the village and the church have the same name. San, uh, San Juan Bautista actually has this motif on the walls in the church over there, all the way in California. So I tried to do a little detective work. And my conclusion is that there were Spaniard missionaries who went from Goa, took this art with them to California because of the, there were missions there. And somebody must have introduced it there. Of course, there was an artist I met over there who said, no, no, this is Native American. I said, no, it's not. It's Goan. And I gave him uh, five examples from our side of the world. It was a fascinating exchange. Next, please. This is my home in Saligaon. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about a typical Goan home. It has a Mangalore tile roof. Mangalore tiles were introduced 120 years ago. If you go to any house, they'll say, oh, this house is 400 years old, 300 years old, 200 years old, but it may or may not be possible. Uh, my conclusion is that they're all about 120, 140, 50 years old. And I'm saying this because Mangalore tiles were introduced 120 years ago. And you see these little corbels, these were the original country tiles. The country tiles are packed with lime to allow the roof to breathe. And when we were Hindus before conversion, uh, there were windows at the bottom of the wall and at the top of the wall, like this. Nothing at eye level. This gave the householders privacy. And uh, when we got converted to Christianity, our houses also got converted. So what happened was we had to have windows, we were told to have windows at eye level and we had to cover them because if we put curtains, curtains don't last in our humidity. So we have, uh, we devised a new way of covering our windows. We put the nacre of the mother of pearl shells. How did we get so many shells? Because pearl fishing and oyster fishing was very popular. Pearls were harvested for ornamentation, for clothing, for jewelry. And I have seen a record where the Auspicio Real or the Royal Hospital had linen with pearls uh, embroidered in them. And this was because our local vaids or boys, as they're called in Portuguese and Konkani, the vaids had told them that pearls were, <laughs> pearls were good for them. So they embroidered pearls in, even in the linen in the hospital, in the Auspicio. So this is a little bit about the architecture. I could go on, but I won't. Next, please. This is an interior of a beautiful house in a village called Kansoli in, uh, in, uh, in South Goa. Uh, you see some very fine examples of uh, furniture and also they kept mirrors. Now mirrors were kept for two reasons. 
One was to give an illusion of, of grandeur. The house looked bigger with a mirror there. Uh, and it's an illusion. And also because earlier we had candlelight, so that reflected the candlelight and there was more light available for the dancers or the visitors or the guests so, and so on. And the third reason is my favorite reason and that is to ward off the evil eye. Because believe it or not, we all believe in it. And if you see that little stencil pattern on the top between the ceiling and the walls, these were stencils that's recently been restored by uh, the homeowner, Savio Siquera, beautiful house. Next please. Uh, this is a, a Hindu house, a Natkani house, these big columns are supporting. And the, the, the Raj Angon or the grand uh, courtyard uh, is, uh, is, is uh, show, uh, showing you that uh, this is the kind of house uh, that is, uh, is a Hindu home, of course, and showing the four uh, corners. The Tulsi represents the four corners of the universe. And uh, the, it's always in square uh, shape. And the columns that you see, that area is called the Vasri in uh, Konkani. Uh, that function, it's a multifunctional space. Children are allowed to play there. Uh, women can sit there, women can sit in the inner courtyard, there's plenty of privacy, they don't have to sit in the, on the exterior of the house, on the front facade, and uh, they, sorry, they also uh, use it as a dining area when there are lots of diners, and the interesting part of uh, our culture is that we have specific places, we have specific uh, spots for the head of the family, all the men, traditionally of course, not now, all the men eat first and surprising, I was surprised to, to hear that even in the most, uh, at, uh, most liberated homes, uh, the men would eat first and then they would leave their platter, the uh, banana platter or their thali, steel thali with some food in it for the wives to eat. And I met somebody called, somebody in the, in the Gaunekar house who said, my gra grandmother was a revolutionary. She changed things. She said, I want my own plate. And everyone was stunned at that time. How come she's asking? She's a daughter-in-law, a newly married woman who's come into this house and is changing the tradition of wanting her own plate. Can you believe it? Next, please. So there are lots of little snippets like this is Gaunekar house. The furniture, you see, this house is like a, house that's going through an identity crisis. The front is European in design. It's got paintings that look like they've been copied from a candy box or a chocolate box. European scenes of mountains and sort of very French avenues and a French farm and so on uh, over the windows. And it's got French furniture that, was, that has come to this house from the Raj Bhavan, Kabu Raj Nivas. Uh, for some political reason, the governor didn't want to have a French room in the governor's palace. So he ordered that all the furniture be auctioned. And this house uh, was fortunate enough to purchase all the furniture. So it's got French furniture and windows with uh, little panels over the windows with French scenes painted on the walls. Uh, we've, we have very few houses where there are framed uh, photos or framed pictures, paintings. It's a very Bombay thing, I think. Here they paint directly on the walls. Next, please. This is a famous uh, house called the Mamai Kamath House. It's in Panjim. They were interpreters to the Portuguese government and uh, they knew many languages. Their, uh, their documents uh, filled four bullock carts when they wanted to give away all their documentation. They had filled four bullock carts and they sent everything to the Xavier Center of Historical Research. But one interesting aspect of this house is everybody celebrates Ganesh, Javat, or Chaturthi in Goa, all the Hindu families. Uh, but this house has Ganpati painted on a paper. It's not an idol that is worshipped and immersed in water. It's painted on paper. And uh, the reason for this is because they wanted to, they were forbidden from worshipping an idol. They were not forbidden, actually. They were told they can't immerse an idol. 
So if you can't immerse the idol after worshipping him for whatever number of days you choose, uh, what would you do? So instead, they drew his uh, uh, image on paper. And what they do now every year is they celebrate Chavad still, even today, 61 years after liberation, they still celebrate with that paper uh, rendering or artistic uh, image of uh, Lord Ganesh. They don't immerse him in water. They throw the flowers in their own well. And because it was forbidden, they used to hide the, even that paper rendering. So even today, 61 years later, they still hide it. And only the head of the house knows where the image, uh, where the icon is. Next, please. Now I'm coming to some, the, since this is about status, it's a status report. I'm coming to the bad news. Some of our homes, now this is a home of Dada Vaidya, three generations of Ayurvedic doctors, doctors who have saved Hindu women lives because they were so conservative to go to a doctor. This, I, this Dada Vaidya had devised a scheme where he would, he, you couldn't ask a conservative Hindu lady for a urine sample, for example. So what would you do? So he would uh, send them to a bathroom or a nani, a bathroom, literally bathroom, nani, and he would collect the sample outside in, through a channel, outside the house. That is how he would analyze the urine sample and he must have saved hundreds and hundreds of lives that way. Otherwise women were dying in childbirth and so on. Uh, but this house very sadly is neglected there are seven families that own it. Most of them are abroad. And uh, the house has got a priest uh, living there. And all his duties are to worship the Shaligram, which is the sacred stone. And that's, that's uh, the status of this house. There are a few artifacts here and there, but it's in really very bad shape. The roof has collapsed, uh, the wall has collapsed. And it must have been a very grand, very beautiful house because it's got stencils on the walls on the first floor in the sala. They must have entertained some very grand, very uh, official, very important officials there. But we have very little by way of records of this house. And it can still be saved, but we will be working on it. Next, please. Uh, we as a group, uh, I'm the chairperson of Goa Heritage Action Group, a group that uh, some friends of mine, Poonam Verma, Mashkarenius, and Raya Shankwalkar started in October 2000. They're trying to document the, and list the buildings, trying to put regulations in place. This is our minister for town and country planning, Babu Kavlekar. We've given him a book, uh, a copy of the book we published, but there are no signs of regulations. And uh, we keep trying, um, but, but they don't seem to uh, be convinced that there is enough to save and there's enough beauty and value in Goan heritage. Anyway, the fight goes on. I'm now coming to all the bad news. Next, please. Here's a very, very sad example of a church in a small village called Veli. Uh, to the left is a picture of the church as it was. To the right is the facade of St. Rock Church, and uh, it, the front facade collapsed. Uh, the reason for its collapse are manifold, but the two main reasons is they built a school next to the church, and they built it in concrete. You can see a concrete beam there on the side wall, and they put the beam right through this mud wall of the church. So a concrete school is built to lean onto a mud wall church. And the front facade couldn't take the weight and it just collapsed one day. The other reason why this church collapsed is that they kept applying for permission to the town and country planning department to restore it, to repair it, to repair it, to repair it. And the two and a half years it took, they did not give them permission. There were many site visits, engineers came, architects came. Conservation Committee members went and saw the site. They were literally pleading and begging. And whenever they touched the walls, it, the, the crumbs were falling, dust crumbs and stone were brittle, had become brittle. They, everyone came, saw, and failed. 
So there we are, uh, a, a sad story. And this is not the only one where this is happening. There are many uh, churches, chapels, shrines, and uh, uh, houses that are going through this kind of uh, treatment, I would say, ill treatment. Next, please. And it can easily be saved. Now, this is a very iconic uh, picture. You've seen it a hundred million times. Uh, that little photo on the left is how the Basilica of Bomb Jesus used to look till the 1950s. Between 50 and 52, the plaster was removed. And there was an architect in Portugal, I believe, who decided that the Portuguese-ness of Goa should be preserved. He did similar treatments in Portugal and exposed the laterite and that, and then they decided never to put it back again. In 93, they, they took a decision to put the plaster back, whitewash it again, to preserve it, to protect it, because this church was never meant to be exposed laterite. They, I don't know why they reversed that decision. One of our members, Fernando Velio, has studied this basilica. Everyone is aware of the problem. But this church, believe me, ladies and gentlemen, is about to collapse any moment. If you touch it, you'll see the stone is crumbling. So this is one of our biggest uh, worries right now. And, and it's a very iconic uh, uh, church. Everyone knows it. Hundreds and thousands of visitors go there. Uh, so we'll have to, we're working on it, but it seems like there are too many people involved and too much uh, happening. ASI is involved, the Archbishop's office is involved, the people, are, everybody has want to, wants to say their two paisa bits and so on. It's not like it was never plastered because this photograph uh, from Sosa and Paul uh, shows us till 1950s that it was plastered. Next please. The other sad story is the Aguada jail. Now, anyone who's been on dolphin tour or something uh, or on the, on the waterfront will have seen this as a jail, Aguada jail. Now, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, they decided to restore the jail and uh, ASI, Archaeological Survey of India, Goa Circle and uh, the <coughs> GTDC, Goa Tourism Development Corporation are supposed to have entered into an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, to supervise the restoration of this uh, iconic jail. It's a 16th century uh, monument, I would say, and it falls within 200 meters of the main uh, Aguada Fort and Lighthouse, which is a protected monument. So it falls in the regulatory zone. Certain NMA rules apply to it. I won't go into the detail, but this is something that is we are very, very exercised about. And the conservation architect and the consultants who happen to be from Bombay, Dharapsha and Company, in their wisdom, decided to change the roofing from Mangalore tiles to UPVC. So there's, there's that little piece on the corner, you see, that is a kind of, uh, of uh, uh, roofing and the old lime plaster has been scraped off. There is cement uh, wall and the sentry cabin, which was laterite stone has been demolished and it's been replaced by concrete blocks. Now, why this was done, we don't know. They were given 20 plus crore for it. They could have done a better job. Now they want to house a museum here, which is a wonderful idea, but they are saying that they have uh, they're going to put a museum dedicated to the freedom fighters because a lot of our freedom fighters were interred here, they were tortured here, and the museum should have got more than 208 square meters. The rest of it is going to be cafes and uh, I don't know what else. Next, please. We have put it out in the newspapers. We've had two, several ping pong battles with GTDC. GTDC has not given us any audience, yet they told the press that uh, Goa Heritage Action Group is with us. They have, uh, it's as if we have condoned it, we haven't. So I keep publicly saying this, that we have not condoned this. And this ping pong goes on. In the meantime, work continues. And it's, uh, it's devastating 
because it's a there for two reasons. One, it's very it's located at a point where everybody can see it from everywhere, especially Panjim. And the second thing is if people see a public building being covered with new PVC roofing, everyone is going to change to PVC. They're going to say if an iconic building like that can use PVC, so we can. Next, please. Now, this is what I call a miracle banyan tree. My colleague Roshan Matthias tells us that the hill was cut illegally. The matter is in the court, so the matter is sub judice. We won't discuss that. But when this hill was cut, this huge, huge, the land with the cut and came down as is and is standing there today like a sentinel, like a, like a statement saying, you can't do this. Next, please. Now we come to the three projects that uh, you might have heard about. Uh, and the, the part that there are many people like Goa Foundation, there are many others who are fighting uh, to stop the railway line from coming through the Mole uh, Sanctuary and Mahavi Sanctuary. We in particular are concerned with the doubling of the railway track in villages where only in four villages that we've studied, there are over 150 heritage houses. And you can see from this picture on my right, what, uh, how close the coal wagons uh, are to this heritage home. How close they are. It's not even eight meters from Savio Siqueira's house. Twice a day, they wipe the soot off the houses and they carry on and they, uh, they protest and we have joined their protest. Uh, we'll see what happens. I'm very optimistic. <laughs> That's really optimistic. Next, please. We've had press conferences. We've informed. These are my colleagues from the village. That's Max D'Souza, Orville. These are uh, Ashok. These are people who we met with the CEC, that is the uh, uh, committee that's empowered by the Supreme Court. They came, they heard us. We're very grateful for the hearing given to us. And uh, we have to wait and see whether we have successfully convinced them not to put a double track railway line passing through these heritage homes. Next, please. We come to our last uh, slide. Uh, this is what, what is called a SACA, which is a wooden bridge. In the old days, of course, there were no mobile phones and no not even landlines or anything like that to communicate between villages. The rivers would swell up and there was no way a person could travel from one village to the other. And even sometimes from one part of the village to another part of the village. And these were little makeshift bridges that were lifesavers for, Go uh, for Goa's uh, uh, lifestyle and for the community. Uh, so this is uh, my, one of my favorite pictures. And uh, uh, this is going to be, this picture is going to be part of the next book, Objects and Memories from Goa. Next, please. That's, that's it. I just wanted to thank everybody who's sent me slides at the drop over hat, my photographers, my Savio Siqueira who opened up his home, Sanjeev Sardesai, Sanjeev Trivedi, uh, Funda Saurian for sharing the Mont uh, at Chapel of Our Lady of the Mount. Mocha, of course, and the Convent of Santa Monica for allowing us to show the secret chapel, soul traveling as well. My fellow heritage homeowners in Goa and my colleagues at GHAG, Goa Heritage Action Group, Wakad, and Goenso Eko. And thank you, of course, to the Museum Society of Mumbai for having me here today and sharing a little bit, a small capsule of our concerns uh, for Goa.